The world exists through three things, the law, worship, and beneficence. Simon, son of Onias, grandson of Jadua, the kingdom of Judea awaits your righteous command. You are the high priest of Jerusalem and a leader of God's chosen people. Only 29 years ago, Alexander prostrated himself and bowed to your grace and intrepidus. And despite the grave threat to yourself and your kingdom, you refused his blasphemous request to place a statue of himself in the holy temple of Jerusalem. In 304 BC, Alexander is long dead, though his shadow continues to loom over Palestine. You find yourself under the yoke of the antagonist Basilius of Phrygia, himself a crow clinging to the bloated corpse of Alexander's former empire. Under your leadership, we no longer need to pay tribute, and the time has come to reassert our sovereignty and rebuild our state in the name of Yahweh. Just as you've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem following Ptolemy's barbarous invasion, you remain a testament to the will and strength of the Jewish people. You are Simon the Just, and it is time for the kingdom of Judea to rise once again. Hello everyone, Elzebo HD here with the first installment of an upcoming series dedicated to Imperator Rome. In the following guide, join me as we cover the optimal starting and mid-game strategies for Judea, a Jewish Hebrew theocracy, and one of the more interesting nations to play in 304 BC. This guide will be broken down into different parts, each corresponding with tips, tricks, and insights that I've tested in multiple campaigns, with the ultimate aim of transforming the former Kingdom of David into a global messianic superpower. Given that Imperator Rome is based around millions of unpredictable variables, much like other Paradox Interactive titles, anything can happen, and this guide details the ideal way in which to proceed. Your campaign may vary, so keep this in mind. Let's get started with the guide. At the start of your campaign, Judea is a small theocratic monarchy that is a tributary state to the massive Diodaki Kingdom of Phrygia to your immediate north, with neighbors that include fellow Antigonid tributary Samaria to your northwest, the sprawling empire of Ptolemy in Egypt to your west, and the non-aligned trading nation of Nabatea to your south, your position is tenuous and we must act quickly. Before unpausing the game, send a diplomat to cancel your tributary arrangement with Phrygia. This is necessary as it will allow you to break free of the barbarous Greeks once and for all, permitting you to conduct independent diplomacy and to fabricate claims in order to expand your kingdom. After breaking tributary status, use 200 of your starting oratory power to fabricate claims in Nabatea, the unallied and largely defenseless neighbor to your immediate south. At this point, we must prepare for war as quickly as possible, so go ahead and order your 8,000 strong army to move to your southern border. Now we should unpause the game, and build between 2-4 to four cohorts of ranged slingers to reinforce your main army. Given that the Nabataean lands tend to have only 6 or less cohorts, it's only necessary that we have a slight numerical superiority, as our starting general has 7 martial discipline, which is far more important in battle than numbers in composition in any case. Once properly positioned and 10-12 to 12 cohorts strong, your army is ready for battle, and we will move into the next section of our guide. After your army is assembled at the Nabataean border, it is time to declare war. The goal in this military campaign is to capture the northern fort of Cassium and the fortified capital of Petra, before pushing southwards to fully occupy the enemy. This war is rarely challenging, and should prove quite easy. In order to avoid attrition, it is a good idea to spread out your armies and siege forts with only 6,000 men, leaving your other soldiers nearby and in a position to reinforce in case of nearby enemy movements. In my test runs, the Nabataean military rarely launched attacks against my cohorts, which ostensibly allows you to occupy the country without incurring losses outside of attrition and minor skirmishes. After you occupy the capital of Petra, the Nabataeans will likely want to sign peace, but do not sign a treaty until you are able to demand all of their provinces for a full annexation. This is crucially important, as it will deprive Egypt from an expansion path via the Sinai and into the Arabian Peninsula and will further allow you to expand southwards to consolidate your power base. Once you demand their full annexation, go ahead and assign governors in both the Sinai and Arabian regions. If you have the oratory power, it is also highly recommended that you assign each annexed province with the religious conversion governor policy. This is imperative as it will ultimately convert the population to Judaism, increase your religious unity, and greatly reduce unrest later in your campaign. By this point in the campaign, it should be roughly 455 to 460 AUC, and the Greek Diodaki states of Phrygia and Egypt are likely at war with one another for control over Syria and Lower Phoenicia. If this is not the case, it likely soon will be, and will provide an excellent opportunity for further expansion. This is because Samaria, your Jewish neighbor to the north, is only protected by Phrygia as a tributary when Phrygian troops are able to defend them. 
In other words, if Egypt is invading Phrygia and occupying territory that surrounds Samaria and your northern borders, as seen in this footage from two of my campaigns, it will enable you to declare war on them without worrying about Phrygia or their allies. This strategy is not without its risks, however, and it might be worth it for you to wait and see if Egypt annexes Phoenicia, which would allow you a safe avenue of attack, since Egypt will always deny the Antagonids military access and thus any way of defending their tributary. Regardless, if you decide to invade Samaria, go ahead and fabricate claims in the provinces of Samaria and send your troops to the northern borderlands. This war will be incredibly easy, as Samaria possesses a token military force, and you might be able to stack wipe and annihilate their armies within the first few days of the war. If these ideal circumstances come into play, you can then occupy all of their provinces and wait for your rising war score to reach plus 25, which will allow you to fully annex most of their territory and a peace deal. Once absorbed into your nation, the Sumerian provinces will greatly boost your religious and cultural unity, as they are populated by fellow Jewish Hebrews. If the wars of the Diodaki have not yet begun, you can skip this step and return later when the opportunity presents itself. Regardless of whether or not you are able to integrate Samaria into your growing kingdom, your aggressive expansion should now be low and your oratory power high enough to continue expanding southwards yet again. If you have the manpower, it is recommended that you build up your military to 20,000 to 24,000 soldiers for the next section of our guide. Once mobilized, go ahead and move your troops to your southeasternmost border, immediately adjacent to the nation of Lehan. With a sizable military under your command and a hopefully competent general for your armies, Lehan and their likely ally Kabar will be no match for the Kingdom of Judea. Once your forces are in place and you are ready for conflict, go ahead and fabricate a claim on one of Lehan's provinces and declare a war of conquest. Although you are likely to have numerical superiority in the upcoming war, you should be particularly careful to mine your attrition across Lehan's desert provinces, as any force larger than six cohorts is likely to bleed your manpower substantially each month. Your primary goal is to capture the Lehan capital Dadan, along with the provincial capital of Harahane, although you can press for further territory if you're able to maintain an advantage over the combined enemy forces. In this recorded example, I lost more than half of my men to desert attrition and warfare, and was forced to sign a peace deal earlier than initially expected. If this is the case for you as well, go ahead and take as many provinces as possible in the peace deal, which will ultimately allow you to expand even further southwards along the peninsula in future wars. After signing peace with Lihan and potentially Kabar, I strongly recommend setting the provinces you just annexed to religious conversion in the governor policy screen. With almost all of the provinces you have annexed and will likely continue to annex belonging to false religions and unaccepted cultures, it is imperative that you convert them as fast as possible to avoid rebellions and high unrest from unhappy pops. Once your provinces are assigned governors and actively converting pops, it is time to shift their attention elsewhere. At this time, you should be actively checking Phrygia and Egypt to see if either one of your Diodaki neighbors are at war. If so, and if they have low manpower, low funds, and most importantly, smaller armies than you, it is imperative that you mobilize your troops to the border and prepare to declare war on them immediately. They have provinces with huge amounts of pops and Mediterranean ports that will increase your trade and diplomatic range, in addition to allowing you to build up a fleet of triremes. If either Phrygia or Egypt are stable or have large armies though, continue pushing southeastwards into Arabia between truce timers, which will slowly build up your power and economy. Check often to see the status of Egypt and Phrygia, and when either one of them becomes vulnerable, it is time to fabricate a claim on a province of your choice and mobilize for war. The time has come to spread the word of Yahweh by fire and flame to our decadent Greek neighbors. Once your troops are mobilized along the Hellenic borderlands, it is time to declare war and begin the invasion. For this phase, I strongly recommend breaking down your main force into two groups, the first being a six cohort strong force to siege forts, and the second consisting of small units of one to two cohorts to carpet siege as much territory as possible. If you have followed the guide thus far, the Diodaki nation you have declared war on will be embroiled in at least one other conflict, and is more than likely unable to respond to your invasion as their forces will be small in number, spread far out, and in faraway lands. The goal in this war is not to fully destroy the enemy, as this will probably be impossible, but instead to occupy all of the cities of your province's war goal so that you can gain ticking war score. This is because Egypt or Phrygia will eventually mobilize to fight against you, probably within a year or two, and their combined economy, manpower, and mercenaries will absolutely obliterate you. It is for this reason that it is imperative that you occupy the war goal as quickly as possible, in addition to as much other territory as you can carpet siege, so you can get a high enough war score for favorable terms 
before the Diodaki ultimately send troops in your direction. If you have been expanding southwards and if your economy can support the relatively high monthly cost, you should consider hiring mercenaries to distract the enemy's main force. These mercenary armies will buy your carpet sieging cohorts and fort sieging main force more time to secure a favorable peace. And if a Diodaki victim is weak enough, might be able to even stack white their army and allow you to occupy their capital. In any case, once you have occupied the war goal and have attained a reasonably high war score, or once the enemy has mobilized that gigantic force headed in your direction, it is time to sign peace. The peace deal will largely depend on whether you are at war with Phygia or Egypt. Regardless, the main focus will be to take the highly developed and populated Mediterranean provinces. Your main priority will be to take Philistria, Phoenicia, and the eastern and central delta if possible, which will catapult your nation into a major power and afford you the ability to make more relevant alliances with the strongest powers in the game. Once you sign peace, it is imperative that you begin assigning governors and converting the provinces as fast as possible, as they will contain hundreds of pops that belong to foreign religions and cultures. If you've made it this far, Shabbat Shalom, and congratulations. The future of the Kingdom of Judea is all but assured, and we can continue to our final phase in the guide. At this point in time, your aggressive expansion will be massive, and your neighbors and your pops will undeniably hate you. Even worse, the threat of rebellion and civil war will be high, as you've been annexing pops of foreign cultures and your province unrest will be extremely unstable. The high priests of Judea need not worry, however, as your economy is undoubtedly large enough to support huge mercenary companies, which will make short work of any enemy that fabricates and declares war on you. And at this point, the threat of war is very real, as the Diodaki you've cut apart will seek revenge as soon as their truce timer inevitably expires, spiraling you and them into an intimate dance of death every decade that will result in them losing again and again if you are prudent and use mercenaries and carpet-sieging cohorts to your advantage. In my sample playthrough, Egypt declared war on me three times after the initial invasion, and although each war was costly and time-consuming, they were absolutely destroyed and sank into irrelevance after the first two conflicts, making each subsequent war progressively easier. Just be careful about rebellions, as they will invariably happen and are really annoying to deal with, but can be avoided if you can keep your pops happy. A difficult task when half of your nation belongs to the wrong culture. For now. For players interested in obtaining the Kingdom of Jerusalem achievements, at this point in your campaign it will be very easy to obtain, and only requires expanding eastwards into Syria and further on to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, assuming you've already conquered the Nile Delta from Egypt. Further expansion should be even easier, given that Phygia and the Seleucids often explode into tiny rump states, providing your nation an endless and easy supply of kosher provinces to expand into. Ultimately, your position in the Levant and the larger Middle Eastern region is now secure, and the future of Judea and God's chosen people lies in your hands. Will you invade Greece and bring the word of Yahweh to your former overlords? Or maybe you seek to spread Judaism to the Far East, provoking a challenging and prolonged conflict with the Mauryan Empire. No matter what you decide, mazel tov, and may the spirit of Simon the Just be with you. We've reached the end of the video, and I'd like to thank everyone for watching. A special shoutout goes to my patrons on Patreon that support the channel and enabled me to produce quality content on a regular basis. That concludes our video guide for the Kingdom of Judea. What Imperator countries would you like to see covered in future guides? Please let me know in the comment box below. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate a like or a comment, as these will really help the channel grow. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. And yes, the military guides for EU4 are coming soon, I promise. Or, or do I?